Okay, welcome to another episode of ChristianPodcast.com. We're your host Beto and Mili, and today we have Chris right all the way from across the pond. And as you may know, just kind of like, you know, want to let you know, we are Latinos, Mili and me are Latinos. And today we're going to be discussing a book that we read in Spanish, okay? So it's called La Misión Cristiana en el Mundo Moderno. But mm. one of the kind of like co-authors is Christopher Wright, which we have today on the podcast. So we're going to be discussing some of the ideas on this book in Spanish, but in English, all right? And then we'll have also a link to our Spanish version of what we learned in this episode. Okay, so first of all, you know, welcome, Mili. Welcome, Chris. How are you guys doing today? I'm doing fine, thanks, Beto. Yes, uh, hi, Mili. Yeah, all's well. I'm here sitting uh, in my little office in central London, London, England, UK. Wow, gorgeous. Well, I'm so excited to be here, Beto. Thank you. Thank you so much. Okay, well, let's kick it off. You know, people's time is precious, <laughs> or so I hear. Um, but so the mission, the Christian mission in the world. I was reading a post the other day somewhere on the Internet. You know, the Internet is full of comments <laughs> from anyone and everybody anywhere. And I think it was YouTube, you know, but it was something along the lines like, what has Christianity done to humanity what like what good has christianity ever done to humanity and i think it was something somebody was asking for like christian businesses oh yeah i think that's what it was he was asking for christian businesses around our area where we live in in orange county california and then somebody replied right in the comments what has what good has christianity ever done and i was i was a little bit um i mean one i wanted to respond right away but then i thought okay you know holy spirit be with me I won't. And all that to say, like, I, I think, you know, the answer to, you know, this question is, has Christianity done any good in the world? Is yes. Right. But we'll, we'll pass the ball to Chris. <laughs> How would you answer that? You know, has Christianity done any good in the world? Well, uh, yeah, I'd want to answer yes too, but I'd also want to say no, because, uh, uh, Christianity is a religion, and religion is not necessarily a good thing And uh, in itself. Um, the whole point about Christianity is that it's, uh, it's an, a religion uh, occupied and carried forward by people, and human beings are flawed and sinful and wicked, as well as also incredibly sometimes good and, and uh, helpful. So I think this is worth saying, Beto, maybe just to mention for people that that book you referred to at the very beginning, before I really get into answering your question, um, which in English is Christian Mission in the Modern World, was originally written by John Stott. And I think John Stott's name is fairly well known, uh, certainly in Latin America um, and uh, in, in the USA, probably among many Latinos there as well. And that was, but it was quite an old book. It was written in 1975. Uh, and it was discussing some key issues like mission, salvation, evangelism, conversion, and so on. And then the uh, the publishers, the original publishers, IVP, asked me if I would update it uh, and sort of edit it and, and uh, bring it into the modern world because that was 1975 and like that was, uh, you know, a quarter of a century or more ago. So uh, it, would, it would be good, really. So that, that's just to let people know it's a book by John Stott, updated by Chris Wright, uh, and it's called Christian Mission in the Modern World. Um, shall I go back to your question? Well, it would be interesting. Uh, did you ever meet John Stott or no? Yeah, yeah. Yes, I knew him uh, personally for many years. I, I met him in 1978. Uh, we became good friends. Um, and then I um, then he, he asked me to take over the ministries of the Langham Partnership, um, which uh, he'd begun, which were basically for churches outside the West in Africa, Latin America, mm -hmm. Asia, um, where many pastors and Christian churches have very few resources sometimes, um, often under pressure. Mm -hmm. um, maybe not much literature, seminaries, not with good teachers. So he established ministries to try to help the majority of world church to grow with depth, not just to grow in numbers, because often mm -hmm. it was growing evangelistically, but lacking in good uh, spiritual depth. And so, uh, yeah, so in 2001, it was uh, 23 years ago, I took over from John Stott, uh, the ministries of what is now known as Langham Partnership. And if anybody wants to find out more, there is a, a supporting, a very strong Langham Partnership in the US, actually, 
as well as in Latin America, we've got very strong supporting um, friends in the Langham preaching movement in Latin America. Just go to Langham, uh, that's spelled L-A-N-G-H-A-M, Langham dot org, O-R-G. And, and the name doesn't mean anything. Um, it's just a street in London wow. because <laughs> John Stott was the, for many years, he was the senior pastor of mm-hmm. also church Langham Place. Uh, Langham Place is, a, as I say, in London where his church was, and he simply named a trust fund, a charity after the street. So the Langham Partnership um, serves the churches outside the, the West, uh, but is largely supported by good friends in the US, the UK, Australia, Canada, Hong Kong, and wow. uh, other parts of the world. So that's that was, yeah, I knew John Stock well. We were good friends. I worked with him until he died. Uh, he died in 2011 uh, at the age of 90. So he had a, a great long life. Mm. Well, that's that's great that you're continuing the legacy in mm. in that sense. And okay, so yeah, going back to the question, yeah. I think um, let's just go to you know kind of like what you said because people might hear it this way. Okay, Christian religion is bad, <laughs> but yeah, no, Christ- yeah, it's not quite what I said. Um, <laughs> what I said was religion is a human thing. Mm. And all things human are a mixture of what human beings are, because uh, all human beings, as we well know, have incredible capacity to be creative, to do good things, uh, to be kind, to be loving, to have friendship, to have good relationships, uh, to, to be an incredible blessing on the earth. But human beings are also incredibly flawed. And we all know that, too, deep in our hearts. Uh, that we we fail, we can be desperately wicked, people can be depraved, uh, they can be violent, they can be hateful. And so religion simply reflects that amazing dichotomy of what human beings are. Religion can be wonderful and good and positive and and a, a force for good in the world, but it can also be something which is deeply oppressive and violent. And we see that too in the world. So it, it but that's not in a sense, the fault is not religion. The fault is the fact that we are human beings. Mm-hmm. And when we get religious, we either can behave well or we can behave badly. But that's just human. So that, that, that would be the first thing I want to say. If we say, has Christianity as a religion been good or bad for the world? Then you have to define what you mean by Christianity as a religion, mm-hmm. as distinct from what Christianity teaches in terms of what it says about God, the creator, about Jesus of Nazareth, uh, and about the uh, life and the influence and the teaching that he has had in the world, um, which is different. I think that's that's the sort of distinction that I want to make. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Just start with this book. I relate a lot. Uh, point he this book point me to Jesus mm-hmm. and empowered me. That's what this book did. Good. Um, Thank you. you know, with my background, Mexican background. And I've been here in the U.S. for only 18 years. Um, My English is not perfect, but I can communicate. And thank you for your patience. (laughs) (laughs) If it's sometimes a little bit hard, right? But um, I understand the religious part. You know, how people want to share the gospel saying, you know, that what Jesus did, and that's it. They think that that's their job, mm. and they pray for you. But they don't go deeper than that. Mm-hmm. And that's the challenge. Because God, or Jesus, when he came, he just not pray for the people. They, he healed them. Mm-hmm. He fed them. Mm-hmm. Right? That's yep. the whole thing. Mm-hmm. So if we are here in this world and we have the Holy Spirit mm-hmm. and we follow with Lord Jesus Christ, we're supposed to be more like him. Mm-hmm. And it's so sad that people just pray for you and that's it. Mm-hmm. They don't go deeper than that. And it's painful. It's mm-hmm. painful. Or, you know, yeah. a, a, or what they do. They do is okay. Bring my money to 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 the to the church, and you do the job. I mm-hmm. just I'm done. Mm-hmm. I did my part. 
Yeah. Yeah, yeah. That is religion. And that's yeah. where we see here. Right. Well, that's what you're seeing there. And the, 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 the problem of that is that that is um, a kind of religion which has become comfortable. In mm -hmm. other words, the people who can behave like that uh, aren't experiencing the pain, the suffering, the poverty, the need uh, that is so much a reality for the rest of the world and was so in the world in which Jesus and the early Christians lived, i.e. the Roman Empire, where they were basically an oppressed, colonized, uh, downtrodden people, the vast majority. Uh, and so the gospel had to be good news. And if it was going to be good news, it could not merely be, here's good news, I'll pray for you, mm -hmm. and you can go to heaven when you die, but in the meantime, just suffer on, be patient. That, that was never... Um, the teaching or the meaning of Jesus. So, um, you know, Mary, what, what you're saying is is the religion of the comfortable mm -hmm. uh, who, who either can give their money or say their prayers, and that's it. And, and that's certainly not Christianity, uh, mean, by which I mean the, the faith in, in, in the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ and what he has done in the world. Um, so th what this book is trying to do, what John Stott was trying to do with this book, was to say that there is a message, there is a there is a truth which needs to be understood. What 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 the Bible, and of course it goes back to the Bible, is trying to tell us is that the the good news that we want to share with people is there is a God, that this is the God who created the world, that he created the world with ultimately good purposes for us to flourish and for his creation to flourish. But as we can easily tell by immediate empirical evidence, the world has been messed up by us. In mm -hmm. other words, by our wickedness, our rebellion, our sin, our violence, our hatred, our greed, our lust, our disorder in all kinds of ways. But the good news is that God chose not to abandon the world. He said, well, that's the way you want it. You might as well have it that way. God actually intervened in his world through the promises that he made to the people of Israel and the Old Testament Israel I'm talking about, the promises that he made to Abram that through him and his people, he would bring blessing to the world. He would bring unity and healing to the world. And then Jesus comes, Jesus of Nazareth, as the one who fulfills that promise. And in Jesus, God actually enters into human life. God doesn't sit up in heaven and say, I'll pray for you, or here's a bit of money to sort you out. God comes in, God gets stuck in, he actually becomes a human being. He experiences the suffering, the pain, the hunger, the thirst, uh, the rejection, the violence. He, he comes and enters into it, and then God in Christ chooses to take all that sin and evil into himself, to bear it, to carry it on the cross through his crucifixion and then to defeat it through death uh, when God vindicates him in his resurrection. Raise, God raises Jesus from the dead. Plenty of historical evidence for that. It's not just a myth. Uh, it's historical fact that God raised Jesus of Nazareth from the dead. And then those who follow him are enabled to live lives which are then transformative because you've got both good news to share of what God has done and what God plans to do for his whole world, but you've also got good news to live out, i.e., you, you become the gospel, you mm -hmm. become the good news that you're sharing that, that one day God will ultimately bring a new creation. Uh, not that we all go somewhere else. I mean, that's, that's a kind of, that's Christian mythology. Uh, the Bible doesn't end with us all going somewhere else. The Bible ends with God coming here. Mm -hmm. uh, John says, then I saw a new creation, a new heaven, a new earth in which God has come to dwell with us through the Lord Jesus Christ. So there's a great story to tell. There's a a narrative at the very heart of the Christian faith, which is what drives me. It, it tells me this is my story. It started long before I was born. It will carry on long after I die unless Christ comes first. But it's a story in which I've got a part to play. I'm actually an actor in this drama. I mm -hmm. play my role within the story that God is doing in his world. So that, that brings tremendous hope. And it means I can't just sit idle and pray for people. I have to share the good news and also get involved uh, in issues of, of justice and compassion and love and care mm -hmm. and you know, issues of poverty and racism mm -hmm. and uh, all these idolatries mm -hmm. that are there. Mm -hmm. Wow, that's good. Want to say something, Lily? Um, when when I was reading the book, I jumped from my chair like a four times, 
And I was wow. running to Beto. Beto, Beto, look. Like he's saying that I don't need to wait for a pastor to send me and do some job or some work. Uh, with my experience, you know, in, in two different denominations, it's so much to to erase from my brain, you know, because they they told me that you need to wait, you need to be sent it to, to do something good in the world. So mm -hmm. I've been sitting, right? Like waiting for a pastor to tell me what to do. Mm -hmm. And then I was really like, no, Jesus already sent you. <gasps> exactly. And I mm -hmm. jump and like, I don't need to wait. Yeah. I'm a missionary here where I am. Amen. Oh my gosh. So I can use my neighbor. I can use, you know, my own family. I can mm -hmm. walk with people in need and God prepare their hearts. Mm -hmm. And the opportunity is right there. Mm -hmm. I had a conversation with a humanist, right? Mm -hmm. And he was saying, oh, how easy is that give everything to God and he will do everything for you. And I told him, you're wrong. That doesn't work like that because no. I have a relationship with him. And he tell me what to do. And it's not easy mm -hmm. because I'm working all the time. He's telling me to do things that sometimes I don't want to do. He's telling me, okay, you went to Costco. You need to give half of everything you bought and give it to your friends. And I was so mad. Like, God, I need this. You know how my kids eat. Mm -hmm. So well, I, think, I think what you're saying um, is so wonderful because... When Jesus gave that great commission to his disciples, he's giving it to all his disciples, not just to, mm. you know, 2% of the church who will go and get paid to do the job for the rest of us. That's mm. one of the things that John Stott believed very strongly about mission, which I believe too, mm. is that God's whole mission is for God's whole church. And God's mm. whole church includes every member, and every member includes the whole of their lives. So we, we are missional in that sense from the beginning and the other uh, great thing in, in what you're saying is that your humanist friend of course may not realize it but his humanism is partly a fruit of the gospel i mean the, the whole thing when when wow. secular people in the especially in the west and especially in the comfortable west like most of the us when they say things like what good has christianity ever done in the world you want to say you need to get out a bit more. You need to actually realize that the whole flourishing of what we call liberal democracy, the idea that all human mm. beings are equal, that we, we have dignity, uh, that it is that, that greed is bad, that actually humility is important, uh, that freedom matters, that, uh, that, that there should, you know, those are all the product of the biblical faith, which affirms that all human beings are made in the image of God, that God loves all people and therefore we should too, uh, that love for our neighbor as ourselves uh, is an important, it, all of these are elements of Christian faith, which were not part of the world before Jesus, wow. uh, except among Jewish people, among Israel, where God had been revealing himself to them ever since Abraham. But certainly in the Roman Empire and the Greek Empire, women were nobody, slaves were nobody, uh, manual workers were nobody. The whole world was transformed slowly by the biblical Christian belief in the equality of human beings and, and image of, made in the image of God and so on. So, so much of what we take for granted in a liberal, secular, democratic, so-called society hmm. uh, is actually in itself partly at least the product of the gospel. Uh, and under and and Christian faith. And it's kind of tragic that, that many people now uh, criticize Christianity on the basis of values that they've actually taken from Christianity. In other words, it's quite mm. parasitical. You know, you sort of thrive on what you've stolen. Um, mm. Of course, part of the problem then is that, that so many Christians, tragically, especially I would say in the West, behave so badly and have become so negative and horrible um, that they, they they give the whole name Christianity a bad name. We, you know, we are accused of being judgmental, of being hateful and spiteful, etc., etc. And sadly, sometimes that's true. So if Christians don't live like Jesus and love like Jesus, 
then it's not surprising if people can say things like that, you know, Christianity has just been bad for the world. Um, so uh, th th that's a sort of response to your jumping up and down and saying you don't have to wait for a pastor to tell you to uh, go and love your neighbor and um, share the gospel and, uh, and be a disciple and be a missionary for him. Yes. Wow. Yes. Wow, you, you're talking so many good points that I'm, I'm taking to heart. So one, I mean, you said all human beings are made in the image of God. I think we all heard that, but it's it's different to to apply it, right? Like, I think if you really believe it, if you see your neighbors as made in the image of God, regardless of whether they're Christian or a different religion or or they maybe you don't like them. Right. Sometimes that happens. You know, there's some neighbors that you don't like, yeah, yeah. but when you can see them as created in the image of God, I think you can see a different set of values. Right. And it's so th that I, I love what you're saying, you know, about the liberal, secular, democratic society we live in. It's almost like we whether we like it or not, we borrowed all these values from Christianity and we're kind of like in the back of our heads, we know they're right. We know they're good. Right. And I think that's, that's maybe like the Holy spirit speaking to our conscience, but to apply them, I think that's where it comes. The, the difficulty, right. Even of being, of saying I'm a Christian, but I, I don't behave like Jesus. So that brings me to this, this, this question, right. I, I think, I don't know. Most people would kind of like know what Jesus did, right. You, you said, you know, Jesus died on the cross, all of that, but, um, why don't why don't some Christians love the way Jesus loved? So how did Jesus love? Why was his love? How was his love different maybe than the love some Christians are portraying, right? How can we go back maybe even to to the love Christ showed us? If if Christianity is based on Jesus, how did he love? What was love yeah. for him? Well, yeah, good questions. Um let me go. Let me take a wee step back, if I may, uh, Beto, before just touching on that, back to that image of God thing, um, because it's actually, you know, as you said, we've all heard that, we all know. Well, yeah, that wasn't true um, back in the ancient world where it first mm -hmm. came out. In the ancient world in which the Old Testament was written, the image of God was on kings. Kings were described as being the image of God, and that, of course, meant wow. the man, a king was the image of God. Nobody else was. Mm. So when Genesis 1 says that God created human beings, male and female, in his image, so it's not just that it's not just kings, it's it's human beings, and it's not just men, it's women too. That mm. all humans, male and female, are the Amen. image of God. It was an incredibly novel, controversial, transformative vision, revelation from God that he's made us to be like himself. Mm. Um, so that was new. But the second thing to say about it is this that in the ancient world, why was the king in the image of God? And the answer is, and this is from many documents and many law codes of the ancient world, the responsibility of the king was primarily to do justice. He was to mm. preserve order, and in order to preserve order, he must see that justice is done because he's the image of the God, whichever God it was. So therefore, to be in the image of God uh, was something that was a responsibility. It was the, it was, you were required to do what God wanted to be done in society if you were the king. Now, so here's God, he says, no, no, all human beings now are made in God's image. So therefore, it's not just that you look at your neighbor and you think, oh, he or she is the image of God, so I need to be nice to them. No, what you have to look at is anybody in society, especially those who are suffering or being oppressed or being treated unjustly, you have to say, hang on a minute, I'm supposed to be the image of God in this situation. If I'm the image of God, if God has made me in his image, then it's my responsibility to do justice. I need to be being what I'm created to be in society. So it's not just a, a passive thing, the you know recipients of being the, the of our love, but also that we are to be that image of God. So if we fail to, to care about social justice or to care about inequality and slavery and trafficking and racism and all of these other things, if we have no concern about those things, then it's a bit hard to claim that we're actually in the image of God, <laughs> even though theologically we are, but we're not behaving as such, if you see what mm. I mean. So coming now, of course, to Jesus, uh, the book of Hebrews tells us that Jesus is the perfect image of God. In other words, he's, he's not just the perfect revelation of God, he's also the perfect human being. Mm. Jesus behaves 
as the man who is the most human of all of us. Uh, it's not just that he was God, but he was God who had become human. He's the image of God, the fully uh, image of God. And so he behaves to others in a way which shows love and respect. Uh, he treats women with dignity. He even brings children into the midst of the of the crowd and says, you know, th th this is th the important person here. Be, be, be like this one. He reaches out to those whom society rejected, like lepers, uh, mm -hmm. or those who were um, immoral in the eyes of society, such as prostitutes, or those who were uh, betrayers, those who were politically hated, like tax collectors who were working for the Roman oppressor. Mm -hmm. And so he reaches out to these people, he touches them, he connects with them, and he draws them into his circle of, of, of the kingdom of God. And that phrase, the kingdom of God, is important too because it basically means God reigning, God in charge, God's government. And if mm. God is reigning in your life, then things turn upside down. Uh, it, it's, it's, it's like mustard seeds growing. It's like yeast developing. Um, it, it's going to be different. So Jesus lives and loves in a way which is radically transformative. And also, by the way, Jesus lived and loved in such a way that was a threat Mm -hmm. Because the established order of things, it, it threatened the, the power sources of the, the Jewish authorities and the Roman authorities. See, they didn't crucify Jesus because he was just nice. You don't crucify people for being nice. They crucified him because all that he was demanding and saying was actually threatening the social order. Uh, and that is often what happens to prophets uh, when they stand for justice or when they stand up for the oppressed. They will come up against the powers that be, which are both human powers and spiritual powers, and they'll suffer. And that's been the story of life all the way through, including into modern times, when those who have stood for justice have often paid the price, uh, often of martyrdom. Mm. Oof. Wow. Do you want to say something, Millie, or I can talk about something? No, you can Millie, talk. Millie, thinking. Okay. I'm just, you know... It, it is so hopeful mm -hmm. to look at Jesus and to see that it's nothing new. It's nothing new. The, the history repeat again and again and again. Mm -hmm. And we're just waiting for Jesus to come back. And the best we can do is just keep looking at him, right? Mm -hmm. And ask him for... For his direction, like praying and fasting and be a good listeners and mm. obedient yes. to his word because he's so much need outside. You yes, know, and, 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 and the thing that it's, it's kind of confusing. Everything, you know, the devil is doing his job that if we know in the world, reading uh, the who is Jesus and, and understanding history too. Right, because mm -hmm. what we do sometimes, and my son is learning this, and I'm learning this, that if we come to the Bible knowing history, we can understand a bigger picture. Absolutely. And we can um, discern more. Yeah. Because well, religion, that's, that's religion is been doing so many bad things. Mm -hmm. good Absolutely. and bad like i heard the other day a guy saying we need religion without religion hmm. like ah makes sense we need yeah, god yeah. to make it our religion but sometimes like like what church is doing is like corporation like a hmm. business you know mm -hmm. and 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 the power and the money transform these people and now they're starting doing stupid things and because it's our humanity, right? Mm. So, well, and that's you see that you, you can see that right through the Bible. I mean, that's true in the Old Testament. God revealed Himself to the people of Israel. He redeemed mm. them out of slavery in Egypt. He brought them through the wilderness and provided for them. He gave them a land to live in. But then they also turned their religion into business. So uh, the temple became a place of of, of wealth and power. Uh, Jeroboam uh, separates off his kingdom and then sets up statues to support his state. So he's using the name of God uh, for mm -hmm. national purposes. That's That happens then. It happens under Constantine. It's happening today uh, in the United States where people are using God 
as a way of defending um, political agendas, which really have very little to do with the Christian faith or certainly with biblical values. But that's that's a common thing. It's it's happened all through history. Mm-hmm. Uh, the, the challenge is how can we resist that? How can we actually see that the faith of Jesus of Nazareth, the crucified and risen one, is very different from the kind of power-hungry, greedy, corporate kind of Christianity that one sees in some parts of the world, though not all. As I say, mainly in the comfortable West. Um, mm. If you you know if you talk to some Christians in uh, in some of the favelas in Brazil or you know in the slums of Lagos in Nigeria or in the, among the outcasts in India, um, their experience of the Christian faith is very different because they are also suffering either poverty or oppression or persecution. Uh, and so they, if they're going to be faithful to Christ, uh, it's a life and death thing. It, it's not just a comfortable lifestyle choice. You know, mm. we need, but don't ask me to be religious. No, you, you really, you, you follow Jesus, you follow him to the cross um, as they do. Uh, I mean, I think the other thing to say in, in what you were saying earlier is that um, the, the problem with, with all human religion, it does tend to become syncretized. I don't know if you know that word. It means where you mix together um, what is of the truth and of the faith with what is basically in human vested interests. So uh, mm. in, in the U.S., obviously, you know, U.S. is a very uh, predominantly an economic society where um, the pursuit of, of, of money and wealth and the American dream is, is very dominant, very powerful, mm-hmm. and that's linked with uh, a desire for independence and freedom and everybody should be able to do what they want to do and so on. So you get some very powerful narratives. This is the way, this is our story, this is our destiny. And when that then gets, as it were, amalgamated with the, the so-called Christian faith, it, it, then people think it's more or less the same thing, that, that Christianity is simply sort of, quote, the Western religion, it's just the American way. And of course, that's very, very different from, from the way Jesus wanted us to be. Wow. Super profound. Uh, and we're actually going to have a talk with a pastor here in, um, I think he's in Arizona, coming up in a couple of weeks where we're going to discuss this idea. Some people call it Christian nationalism, right? Yeah. So it's this idea that, uh, that you know, we, we exactly what you said, you know, that our nation is a Christian nation and it's more about like the religion of Christianity mm-hmm. than being like Jesus, right? And yeah. actually his book is How to Love Your Christian Nationalism. So be on the lookout for that one. But there's I some really, it. yeah, want to say something? You have it there? Wow. Oh, wow. <laughs> <That's> <laughs> Disarming cool. Leviathan. Yeah, so we're going to be speaking with I met, Caleb Campbell. I met Caleb, I met Caleb Campbell just a couple of weeks ago. We had lunch together. He was over here in London. Um, wow. So wow. I, I know yeah, yeah. No, I think that's, I'm, I'm glad you're having that discussion because it is very important to help people to see that Christianity is not nationalism, never was. Mm-hmm. Uh, it's as old as Constantine. It goes back to the Roman Empire. Um but it's not the truth. It's not the true gospel. It's not the mm. real faith. Mm. I have um, a beautiful friend of mine. She's Armenian, Orthodox. Mm-hmm. Her son is going to a private school and they're, they're Baptist. And this little kid, he's only 13, 14, 13, 13. 13 years old. And he is diving. He's eating the Bible and not just the Bible. He's listening to all the pastors online (laughs) and looking for the truth. Mm -hmm. And he came to his mother and told her, mom, I'm not Orthodox. I'm sorry to say that, but I don't believe in a lot of things they do. But he is going to this school and he is having, um, conflict with the principal and all the teachers but he also thinks different than them mm-hmm. and they make him feel bad right so mm-hmm. to that point that my my friend came with the, with her family and she told him mom i feel so bad for my son i'm going to stop saying that i'm orthodox mm-hmm. Because, oh my gosh, look, I'm, I'm doing exactly like the Baptists are doing. Because if it's not their truth, 
like you're you're stupid and you're bad and you're going to hell. Yeah. And I feel like I'm doing exactly the same thing to my son. Mm. Saying that I'm unorthodox and the, like, no, you know, I'm gonna say I'm follower of Jesus Christ mm. and that's it. Yeah, well, that is the most important piece. And I think, I mean, part of the challenge there, of course, is that if your friend is Armenian Orthodox, then that is an identity. Mm -hmm. um, it, it's not easy to say I'm not Orthodox if you're Armenian, um, because that has been, I mean, Armenia was the, the first Christian country mm -hmm. in the world, mm -hmm. I mean, it, 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 uh, going right back to, I think, about 320 AD. Um, and, and that was um, a form of the Christian faith, which then became Eastern Orthodox. It's also there in, in Egypt uh, and in Greece and, of course, you know, in Ukraine and Russia as well. Uh, so the, the, the Orthodox tradition is very strong. Um, and so that's why I say it, it would be very painful for your friend to, to stop. But if she at least recognizes that being a follower of Jesus and believing in Jesus for our salvation is the most important thing beyond whether you're Orthodox or Baptist or Reformed or Presbyterian or whatever else. That's a good thing. At least she's saying that. Mm. Um, and I would hope her son also would be um, would be sort of wise enough, even though he's very young, to realize that, yes, he's, he's learning a lot, but you don't necessarily throw out the baby with the bathwater, as we say. In other words, um, Orthodox Christianity, there are things there too that I would disagree with um, in some of their faith, but Orthodox Christians for 2,000 years um, have suffered greatly, have, have mm -hmm. preserved the faith, mm -hmm. uh, ha have been able to you know, resist um, the inroad of Islam in some parts of the world and to survive. Uh, and so one needs to respect that, that tradition, mm -hmm. even with theological disagreement. And I, I think I want to say that in relation to your friend's son, that uh, he may learn, he may decide that he believes other things and doesn't believe what Orthodox all teach. But I would hope that he would respect the antiquity of that tradition. No, and I think he's doing that. The same with yeah. my friend. You know, yeah. she she's so yeah. proud to be an Armenian yeah. and. And yeah. I, I, I just told her, honey, I think you had a revelation from God. Mm -hmm. And I'm glad and I'm so happy that your son can talk to their priest. They have yeah. a close relationship. This kid is calling yeah. his pastor first time in the morning. Hey, I have this question. And he's answering. Good. He comes Good. to uh, our church too sometimes. And he will have the same debate, uh, debate with my pastor. So... Yeah. You know, yeah, 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 it's beautiful. That's good. Yeah. Wow. Well, so some good points that I thought, you know, were amazing to bring up. You know, we're kind of like, this is what we do in our Spanish show. You know, for those of you who okay. speak Spanish and want to listen to our show, we relate like basically everything we go in life and how we're following Jesus in the day to day, you know? So we're kind of like laymen. We're not super theological, even though we read the Bible, we love theology. We love like all topics, you know, God and Christianity. But it, for us, it's always like, how does that translate to you know, our friends, our relationships, the people around us, right? That's why yeah. it's so important for us to reflect on, on, you know, what some people might call just the the day to day, right? The routine. So with that, you know, I've been reading the Bible in a year, and we're still in the Old Testament, you know, since January. It's called the Chronological Bible. So it's giving me a, a really great scope of the the history of the Bible. You know, and I think I've read the Bible many times, probably all the books before. But I think just having a format and all, also the chronology. It's really yeah. helpful, but one of the things I'm getting from the Old Testament that happens again and again, and you refer to this, is the prophets, right? So the prophets from God that come and speak to the kings, and you said that that kings are supposed to um, admonish justice and, and govern, right? And govern with fairness. So uh, the prophets call out the kings because they're not doing that. Right. And they say, you know, you have oppressed the poor. You know, you have mistreated the widows. You don't care for the orphans. And we can relate that to what Paul says later on. You know, the only true religion is like loving on the widows and the orphans. You know, I mean, something so simple. And you see that same heart throughout the Old Testament with the prophet saying it again and again. Yeah. And again, yeah. you know, this is what God cares about. Mm. And the kings are doing 
everything mm. but right so all that to yeah. say you know i can relate so much to what is happening here in america you know we're latinos but we're here in america and you know you hear these names that i don't want to give power to these names today you know but like political powers political names on left and right all the time you mention them and everybody pays attention you know why why are we going to talk about today about this guy or that woman or right and yeah. what i love is that god brought us here you know we're latinos and you're saying that the the west has gotten comfortable and i see that that happened to the to the people of israel and specifically, I think when they came into what it's called Gilgal, where they where they made an altar or Gilgal. And, yeah. you know, it's, it's basically when Joshua takes the people from slavery across the Jordan into the promised land. Right. Mm -hmm. So it's almost like from our bondages to the freedom that we have now. But that that freedom, right, that liberty of doing whatever you want made them too far. powerful and proud that they started forgetting about the people in the, you know, the, yeah. the lower classes, you know, so to say. Mm -hmm. So I see that's like we said, you know, that happens throughout history again and again yeah. and again. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Right. No, I think that's right. And I think that's why I'm glad you're reading the Old Testament because it's so neglected in so many churches in, in the West, isn't it? You know, people never preach the Old Testament because they don't know what to do with it. Mm. I think one of the, one of the reasons God gave us the Old Testament is he shows us through multiple generations over many centuries just how repetitive history is, as mm -hmm. if to say, don't you get it? You know, mm -hmm. can't you see that this is what will happen, mm -hmm. that uh, God will do wonderful miracles and things will be, you know, there'll be liberation and freedom and so on. But then we're all human, we're sinners, and we'll, we revert back to the ways of injustice and greed. Uh, and so one can see, you know, that, that, that say that, you know, the foundation of the United States of America that was, was out of, uh, you know, the, the, the colonial area of, of, of Britain and a desire for freedom, a desire to be independent and all of that, all good things, um, great, great desires, great objectives. Uh, but then it becomes corrupted into a kind of dream of, of, of wealth and prosperity. And then, you know, you get the um, also the, the, you know, the sins of slavery and of uh, um, of the genocide of native populations, um, and then the expansion of power, you know, down to Latin America and around the world and so on. So you get all the things that are actually illustrated in the Old Testament. <laughs> um, God brings him into the land, you end up with Solomon, he starts off well, and then he becomes a tyrant. You know, Jeroboam leads the people out from under Solomon, Re Rehoboam his son, and then he becomes, leads Israel into sin. So, you know, there is a sense in which the prophets, we need the prophets of the Old Testament because their voice still speaks into contemporary uh, world today and says to political rulers, look, this is what God requires. And if you fail to live in this way, if you abuse your power, then in the end, God will humble you. God will bring you down. Mm. Um, and I personally think that the, the West in general, which I would include my own country, the United Kingdom, mm. that the West in general really is coming towards the end of its natural. <laughs> That's to say, God's had enough of us. Mm. Um, all empires rise and fall. Uh, no empire lives forever. That's another lesson of the Old Testament. You know, the, the empires come and the empires go. They may last 70 years or 100 years or 700 years, but in the end, uh, they collapse. And I think Western civilization has reached such a stage of um, idolatry and violence and greed and debt mm. uh, and um, immorality yeah. that you know we we are experiencing god's you know the era of mm. god's judgment um I, and that's not very nice but the point the point is that jeremiah speaks to the people of israel and judah when they had gone under god's judgment into exile and he tells them the mission goes on you're still mm. the people of you're still the people of Abraham. I mean, yes. Be a blessing where you are. He says, you know, seek the welfare of the city where God has put you. Maybe Babylon, the you know, the wickedest city on earth, but that's where you are. So, uh, you know, pray for the people there, seek their welfare, do what is right and good, mm. and be there with God. So even though I believe that the West uh, is under God's judgment, we as Christian believers in the West still have a missional responsibility to live for him and to share the gospel and to be agents of the kingdom of God in the midst of all of that. That's still our calling. The mission goes on and hasn't stopped. Mm -hmm. uh, so th those are the sort of thoughts that I hope they 
are reinforced from the Old Testament because the, let's remember the Bible is the great story of God. The, the Bible is the, the true story of the whole universe with, mm -hmm. from creation to new creation, uh, creation and rebellion and then redemption and then uh, ultimately the vision of a, of a hope, of a future of hope and blessing. Uh, it is the true story and we need to get people into that story, yes. not just a verse a day from some promise box, mm -hmm. but actually to this is the story I'm in. This is the identity I have uh, as a follower of the Lord Jesus Christ. So That's good. beautiful. So hopeful. So hopeful. Okay, so this is what we're going to do. We're going to mm -hmm. go to our emojis, okay? So we mm -hmm. have the famous five emojis right here from Blasphemous to Divine. So this is what we're going to do to wrap up the episode. We're going to okay. walk through the five emojis, starting with mm -hmm. the worst idea, walking to the best idea and this would be um uh, i'll just throw this out there right it doesn't need to be this way but if you can think of latinos on mission as you walk through these five emojis that would be awesome you know just because we're latino right so kind of like we want to the us. message for you yeah we want the <laughs> message like directly to us right so <laughs> we'll see so how what's the worst thing about what the worst thing uh that one can do or the or yeah what what, what worst just the, what the worst idea i just say you know what's it can either be a blasphemous thought was the worst idea was something that you even like almost like mad about or angry about um well i think the worst idea in in the west today is that we are our own masters that we have the idolatry of the self uh, mm -hmm. you can be whatever you want to be um you can't <laughs> Boom. Sorry. One, we are okay. our own god Right? Yeah, Our exactly. own God. Yeah. From the, the little children from even primary school, oh, you can be a little princess, you can be whatever you want to be. Mm. And actually, it's not realistic and it becomes idolatrous. Wow. Yeah. Okay, I love that. Skepticism, where do you see skepticism played out? Maybe in the West or with Latinos in on mission? <laughs> yeah. I think we should be skeptical about our own ability to change the world okay mm -hmm. um there's only one savior it's not you it's not me it's jesus mm -hmm. uh we are called to be faithful let's be skeptical about uh about the great big ideas we're going to change the world we're going to have wonderful big meetings but you know sometimes we need to get a little bit more realistic and, not, and a bit more skeptical of our own abilities love it okay next one is inspire so it gets better right where do you yeah. see hope or what inspires you What inspires me is the vision of the future, because the future belongs to the kingdom of God uh, and uh, Jesus reigns. He is the ruler of the kings of the earth. He says that in Revelation 1. Jesus says he is the ruler of the kings of the earth. So ultimately, Putin, Trump, Biden, everybody, they, they come under Christ in the end uh, and he will deal with them. So to me, that gives hope. Yeah. Love it. Okay, one to the last. Holy emoji. What's a holy idea as it relates to mission in the world uh, Jesus well Moses says Leviticus 19 be holy for I am holy says the Lord and then if you read Leviticus 19 being holy isn't about being super special religious mm. uh, Leviticus 19 is just about everyday ordinary life in the home the family the workplace the business the field the farm the law court Uh, social relations, race relations, uh, and, and that's holiness. So be holy uh, has to do with everyday life and living with integrity. Love it. And the final emoji is the divine emoji. So what's a divine idea, the highest of highest you can think of? Emmanuel, God with us. Because the Bible ends with the last great Emmanuel. God says then the dwelling place of God will be with man that's revelation 21 uh, let's remember that we don't go somewhere else to be with god no emmanuel means god comes to be with us that's what he built the tabernacle for that's what the temple was for that's why jesus came to be with us and that's what will happen in the end we don't go anywhere else we are already home we just need the home to be cleaned up uh, when when christ returns uh, and god will be with us forever that's the divine emoji <laughs> love it forever and ever amen wow that, that was so powerful thank you so much chris that was uh, i yes. love that theology i think that's uh, you know whenever somebody comes to me with a different theology i'm like this is my theology 
God is going to establish his kingdom here. I love that. You know, I resonate so much with that. And I think uh, it would make, make us act differently. You know? Mm. It would. Yeah. Okay. So, okay, do you, need, do where, you need me to stay online a while? Yeah. Where do you want to point people to if they want to get your resources? Again, you mentioned uh, linkham.org. Yes, is that the place? Yes. Well, I'll give them two websites. One is uh, langham.org. That's uh, the organization I work for. And you can also find out about John Stott there. I do have my own website where all my books are. And that is christopherjhwright.com. That's my full name on my books, ChristopherJHWright.com. Uh, so that's got all my books and also all my sermons and podcasts and things like that. So that's where people can find out more. Love it. Thank you okay. so much. Hopefully we can have another one. You know, we, yes. we learn a lot. And uh, so, so okay. thank you so much for your time. That was wonderful. Mm -hmm. Thanks, Marie. Thanks, thank you friends thank you for being here if you like this episode you know you can like subscribe share it follow us on christianpodcast.com on all the social media on facebook youtube apple Podcasts, spotify all those good places we'll see you guys on the next one okay, okay. ciao